This is February 7, 1992. I'm Sarah Tucker interviewing Ruth Ann Hackler for the Kansas Women Legislators Oral History Project. Well, let me start out by saying that you are a representative from District Number 15. Correct. And your home is Olathe, so I presume Olathe is somewhere in District 15. What exactly is District 15? District 15 is the west part of Olathe and part of the north of a of. Then I have two precincts presently in on that side, hmm. which are very divergent. I say I have a microcosm of the state because I have everything from a really old housing area in Lenexa to one of the real posh subdivisions to the north end of Olathe, which is basically our black community and a lower socioeconomic group of people to the older part of town where I live, and in addition to that, I have new housing developments out west of town across Highway 7. Well, you really do have it all then. I, you were first elected to the legislature in 1990, so this is the second year of your second first year. term. Uh, are you thinking of running again? Yes. Okay. How did you first get in politics? I've always been interested in politics. Um, my husband and I had to do it in a three-pronged uh, petition to do it. But anyway, uh, we got the city manager commission form of government in Olathe. He and I co-chaired that. My goodness. And had some interesting experiences in trying to get that. But it took us three different tries at it to get that accomplished. And then I ran for the school board in 1969. That's what it says here. Yeah. And have been elected to the Olathe Board of Education six different times. Olathe, as most of Johnson County, is primarily Republican. Mm -hmm. Because of our population increase, we have uh, we had two new seats at the time I ran. Oh. So there was no incumbent. And I ran, and I won by four votes. I was going to ask you what 0.08% of the <laughs> vote was. That, that's about as tight an election as I can imagine. And then I was sued, and I... Not by my opponent. He said he had nothing to do with it. However, the people who sued me uh, gave him money and so forth. But anyway, that's another story. And I had to defend it in, in uh, district court, and I won that case. What was the basis of the suit? <coughs> they felt that uh, people who had voted should not have voted. Oh. And so we received word on the... Friday before Christmas last year that uh, I had been sued and that we would be in court the Wednesday following Christmas. So we spent that Christmas holiday typing subpoenas, doing all sorts of legal work. I don't mean that with the notice of that we'd been sued, the notice that we would be in court mm -hmm. on that Friday before. So we had, had to really work that weekend. So when did you know that you were definitely going to serve? Um, the judge ruled uh, that same day. Oh, okay. That, however, the procedure is when it goes through the legislature. And ah, and you just happened to be overshadowed by an even closer case, so yes. that's why I probably didn't yes. hear so much about yours. Okay. Well, that's that's a real squeaker. Um, <laughs> what? How did you come to win, and what was involved in this incredibly close race? The base of my opponent was right to life. Ah. And I had uh, a lot of people who had known me for a number of years who thought they trusted my judgment in a lot of matters. The interesting thing about my district is that there are 1,500 registered Democrats. 1,500 mm -hmm. independent voters, Good and heavens. the rest of the 8,500 registered Republicans. So I had to have a great crossing of people voting to vote for me. And I am looking at numbers that say 2,255 people voted for you, which means you did indeed have a mm -hmm. very large crossing. Mm -hmm. um, how did you go about crafting this campaign? What did you do? I had help from uh, the, the uh, well, Gary Blumenthal, uh, who is a, 
of Democrats and uh, Shoney uh, worked, Miriam, I guess, worked very hard and taught me how to run in the first place. And he has a rather sophisticated uh, campaign set up, not organization, but set up. We had, uh, I had a number of people across the state who were quite interested in seeing me a lot. Mm -hmm. I have been a, quite interested in education for years. I served on the elected school board that long. I'm a past president of the Kansas Association of School Boards. And there are those who thought that I had something to offer for education in the state. Yes. I had a, and the reason I'm telling you this, I had a, a lot of the teachers in my community who really worked very hard to see to the mm -hmm. For the first time, our uh, Latha NEA actually gave me a very fine monetary contribution to my campaign, as well as many of them worked and called and walked into that literature. And it wasn't strictly an education thing, but I'm telling you, that was the mm -hmm. nucleus of those who worked for them. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of, of good advice from some Democrats mm -hmm. and some people of your who hold your various ideas, and then a lot of education. That's right. And I think it's interesting, as long as I was on the school board, mm -hmm. that the teachers would feel that they want to support me. Call that pretty good endorsement. When you did then um, come up here to Topeka, did you have a, a clear sense of what the job was going to be, how you were going to do it, what your style was going to be? Probably not, other than the fact that having been on the school board for as long as I had, you know from that experience that you're not going to please everybody. And the vocal few who sometimes try to sway your judgment, you have to weigh against those who silently sit back and support you. Mm. And I, right or wrong, I had the philosophy that uh, people, most people would understand that. And most people expect you to use good judgment. Uh, and they trust your judgment. They don't put you in a position to, to act on it. And that's sort of my style. Okay. You there, there are many issues that, you know, they will almost fall half and half on uh -huh. what people would want to do. So it ultimately comes down. You take the heat and you make the decision. I see you're a member of education, a member of governmental organization, a member of political, public health and welfare. Yes. Um, were these the committees you asked for? Pretty much so. Okay. Then in addition, I'm on a joint committee that's both set in the house, that's arts and cultural resources. Okay. And that's kind of a fun one because you go out travel over the state and look at the various uh, things that the different communities are doing at the state house fund. Huh. Yeah. Spend time with Chautauqua, Hutchinson. We were in Liberal and Gardens. I enjoy Salina. that when I'm not driving by myself. When well, I'm driving that's by right. myself, that's right. it's not so great. But yeah. Um, obviously, I can understand why you wanted education. Why did you want governmental organization in public health and welfare? I didn't ask for government organization. Gary Blumenthal asked to have me on that. He's the chair of the committee. And it has probably turned out to be one of the most interesting things that you could find. I don't know how much you want of what I have done or involved. I'd love to hear about it. He appointed me chair of a subcommittee last year, which was my first year. It was unusual for a freshman to be appointed. But then with this gray hair, I'm a usual freshman up here. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, it, the thrust of our charge was to determine whether or not the, the government, state government, enhanced or inhibited services to children. Mm -hmm. And out of that, we had numerous uh, people here, advocates for children, who talked about what they did in the various organizations as well as state agency people. There are some 43 agencies in state government that deal with children and their problems. There are 46, I believe, federal agencies. So what we tried to do was to see how we could uh, work across agencies and try to come back some of the education of children's services. As a result of this, one of the, this was a four-person uh, committee. Richard Lottie, who works for Boeing in Wichita, had the 
capability of putting us with uh, Boeing's TQM trainers, which is mm -hmm. total quality management. And they have said that they would like to involve somebody, and so we spent a day with them training agency people in SRS, Health Environmental Education. And out of that little four person subcommittee, and I'm delving into some of this, SRS is going through all kinds of training. They started Wichita and they moved to Topeka using the Boeing concepts, Boeing training them. And Boeing is doing this gratis. They only ask that these people come to Wichita to be trained. And this is feathering out over the state. In addition, uh, I understand that the governor is uh, issuing an order. In fact, I got that information today that this will be going into other agencies, which makes me feel that you can come up here pretty inexperienced in some of the things, but using common sense and good judgment, you can begin to make some changes. That's very hopeful. Um, did you have any, have you any mentors or role models that you found particularly well, useful? As freshmen uh, Democrats, we are assigned mentors. And Carol Sater and Gary Blumenthal are my mentors. And I could not find a, a better mentor than Carol Sater. Very intelligent woman, very astute, very knowledgeable. How would you describe your job here? It's exciting. Um, there are things about it that are fun. The I've been very much impressed with the caliber of people with whom I work. They're bummers. There are, well, you'll find them any place. Uh, but for the most part, regardless of differences of opinion and politics and so forth, I think most people up here are pretty dedicated to making changes or trying to make us a better state in which to live. And I've been pretty impressed by them. Sounds good. I work very long hours. I'm here sometime between 7 and 7.30 every morning, and I generally leave for my little efficiency apartment anywhere from 9.30 to 10.30 Those are long last, hours. Last night it was midnight. But I feel I'm set up here to do a job, and I owe an obligation to, to uh, make myself knowledgeable about the issues and ready to vote. I also have uh, taken it as my responsibility that I am a state legislator, and whether or not a person writes to me or calls me, and where they live doesn't make a difference. They're either that make a difference if they're in my district or not. I try to answer them, and I make a lot of work for myself. And a couple of weeks ago, I had a fellow who lived in Emporia, and he had called a couple of times and missed me, and wrote and said that he would very much like to discuss his problem with me before the legislature started. Turned out he was working as a, an engineer, design engineer for the city of Emporia. And he was going through this. He had taken two years of work at the uh, technical school in Salina, which is part of KSU. And then part of his being able, permitted to take the examination as a practicing engineer, a PI, PE. Uh, he had to put in so many years' experience, and he was ready within a year to take his examination. He had worked on this all these years. Mm -hmm. They were about to pass uh, a bill going through a government organization that, by the date on it, would have prohibited him taking that examination. Oh, okay. So all of these years of his working toward this goal would have been down the drain. I met with... Uh, the person who was the attorney for the technical uh, group, engineers, architects, etc., and told her of his predicament, and we worked it out that that has changed. And then I called him and told him to come and testify on the committee, which he did. I did not know until it was all over with that he had written every legislator on that government organization committee and had called most of them, and I was the only one who responded to him. But I feel that I have helped mm -hmm. a fellow human being and saved his aspirations for, before it was over eight years of training to get ready to take this examination. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And you do have it. It's like it's that of interest. Well, I have a general question I always ask, which is, what have you done so far that seems memorable? I think you've already given me two examples. Um, have there been any bills um, or issue fights that you've been involved with so far that seem to you also very... One of the things that I did last year, um, and if people look back on this, the, the attitude about burning the flag may or may not change, I don't know. But we had a group of uh, people who felt that there should be a flag burning bill. And we had a bill, a resolution that we were sending to Congress that uh, Kansas has a long history of basic human rights and protecting people and women's rights, this kind of thing. And so um, they came to me, and uh, I'm of the vintage that uh, my husband and brothers were in, in World War II, and asked me that since I had experienced that period of my history, that I talk on this fibering issue. So I went down, and poor Zoe got a little bit emotional because I took the brothers that I had, and my nephew, all of whom were veterans, and one of them has a silver star, and one of them uh, was on the USS California and was uh, bombed by the Japanese. And, but anyway, I pointed out that uh, that I was a patriot by my living in history in a certain period of time, but that uh, every one of my brothers and my nephew would say if they were still living that the important thing is that we preserve our basic rights and that we don't start fiddling around with the Constitution of the Bill of Rights. And I felt that uh, what I said had been important. Sounds good. And then I, one of the things I have really been proud of, I was asked again, the only freshman, to serve on the uh, Children's Initiatives, mm -hmm. the Special Committee on Children's Initiatives. And we are seeing a lot of things coming out of that. And I mean, a lot of legislation is in the hopper and moving along and I can't divulge it right now, but as of Monday, there's going to be a great announcement of some money that's coming toward setting up uh, a fund to, to help implement some of the things we want to do. Great. As you might suspect from this project, which is focused on women, we have a few questions about your sure. experience as a woman. In terms <coughs> of especially the legislature politics of getting the nomination and running, but also in, in your experiences here so far, would you say it's made any difference in any way that you are a woman? I have never run, quote, as a woman. I didn't for the school board and I didn't for the legislature. I feel that women have come up with a, maybe a different perspective on children's issues, uh, concern about the elderly, et cetera. I found this when I was on the school board, and unfortunately in my own district now, I was replaced by a man, which means there are seven men on the school board, so there are no women right now, but there's an election in April. Um, Gary Blumenthal has said that people look at me and they think I'm a sweet little old lady until I set my feet and, and uh, tell them what I really think. And I, I am not uh, intimidated by men, nor am I by women. And I feel that if you can be your own person, that you don't have to say, vote for me because I am too or I am woman. Mm -hmm. But you haven't found any... Um, barriers, any misperceptions um, that really mattered? I grew up with seven brothers, and I think maybe I uh, can relate to men and the male figure better than maybe some women can, because I have been around men so much in my life. Mm -hmm. I am uh, pleased that uh, I have daughters who are pretty independent. I have one who is an attorney, uh, one who uh, received her doctorate this last spring from KU, teaching pediatric nursing. And my other daughter is um, uh, a mother of uh, two, expecting again within the month, and perfectly happy to, even though she's trained as a gra graphic artist, she wants to be a wife and a mother and stay home. And that's great. That's what she, she should do. That's what she wants to do. That's a nice mix. Well, let me just follow that right into 
the family side of your life. And what I'd like to start with is your, your early family, where you were born, where you were brought up, what kind of parents you came from. Sure. I am the uh, youngest of 11 children. My oldest sisters were twins, and one of them lived a very short time and died. Mm. Um, because I am the youngest, and I had my 68th birthday Sunday, um, I've lived through kind of an interesting period of time. My mother, um, I might say we were Protestants. Uh, people have asked me if we were Catholic, and I said, no, I just had sexy parents. <laughs> but uh, had they lived in a rural area in Arkansas. I was born in Rogers, Arkansas. And she died, unfortunately, when I was six years of age, mm. shortly after my sixth birthday. So I was reared sort of by pseudo-mothers. My older sisters sort of took turns of taking the three younger ones to family who were left. And I lived in Rogers, Arkansas, Harrison, Arkansas. And my father uh, was a, a great Arkansas gentleman. He was a traveling salesman. And so he was gone a great deal. He actually was on the road five days a week. So finally, I think two of my older sisters had moved to Kansas City, and they felt that the home situation wasn't too good because another sister was trying to get her degree at the University of Arkansas. And so the two that were living in Kansas City, Missouri, took the two remaining brothers and myself to live with them. And it was during the Depression, the height of the Depression, and it was an interesting family mix. Many times there were 15, 16 for dinner because people collected other people around them, their friends, and brought them in to where they thought there was a plate on the table. Mm -hmm. It was, um, in some ways, it was a very difficult time, but on the other hand, you learn to work as a family and help each other. And I'm very close to, have been very close to my family all those years. We're down to four right now. I have my, one of my older sisters is living. And I have a brother who has terminal cancer, both lungs, and, mm. and another brother who has emphysema and has been completely in with them for about four years. Mm. And me. So. Have you always been a Democrat? Why are you a Democrat? I'm an Arkansas Democrat. <laughs> Uh, I'm a Democrat because I, uh, and I ran uh, on a platform that I would help people who, uh, who were uh, fragile and needed some help. And this is basically what I have tried to do. We have a lot of people in the legislature, a lot of people, particularly in our state, who seem to be interested in only uh, taxes and mill levies and bottom line, and I'm very much interested in people. I think part of that's my background, mm -hmm. that it comes out. You say an Arkansas Democrat. Would you like to define what that is? <laughs> I said that facetiously. Uh, I think just as Kansas is known for its preponderance of Republicans, Arkansas is known for its preponderance of Democrats. Uh, no, I, I think my whole family is family always, always uh, there was a caring this filters down to children and family. My children are Democrats. Um, you are married to a husband named Eugene, I That's believe. That's right. We celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary the 27th of December. Not bad. Not bad today's world. At all. And the nice thing is we still like each other. Even better. <laughs> Even better. Um, how did you two come to meet? He was dating <laughs> one of my girlfriends, <laughs> and she, he had come back from World War II, and I had just finished uh, at Washburn and you know, received my degree, and she and I were living in a rooming house. It was right after the, well, the war was really was still going on, and housing was pretty limited. And so we were living in this rooming house and going out to eat our meals, and we didn't have kitchen privileges, and, and we ran into him where we were eating, and uh, I can't think of it right now. It slipped me the name of the little tavern eating place that's on College Hill. Um, Gee, I don't know they changed Gracie's? Not Gracie's. Anyway, I mean, there's. Okay. And so we sat and talked, and 
going home that night, Rosie said, Ruthann, he likes you better than he does me. And I said, oh, no, he doesn't. She said, well, he'll call you for a day. Sure enough, he did. We were married a couple of years later. And you had three children. Three children. And you list now your occupation as homemaker? Have you always been a homemaker? No, I taught high school. Back when, uh, he, when I met him, in fact, I was working uh, as secretary to Mr. Brailsford of Brailsford Gifford, Gifford and Hardesty, which is, uh, was, and it's still going by the name of Hardesty, a CPA firm in Topeka. And I had worked as a student as secretary to Dean Sellon at Washburn and also had worked uh, around my, I was office in the Red Star's office. So I'd been out of school for about a year and Gladys Finney, who was the registrar at that time, called and said, would I be interested in coming back out as assistant registrar at Washburn? And I said I would if she would allow me time off to take my practice teaching so I could mm -hmm. get my teaching certificate. And she said, sure. So then when Jean, uh, this last year in law school, I taught at Washburn Rural mm -hmm. and then taught at Olathe High School, taught business. And did you teach sometimes when your children were at home? or? Oh, yes. I substituted up until the time I was elected to the school board. And then as a matter of uh, my own personal conviction, I felt that it probably wasn't appropriate for me to teach as well as be on the school board. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> But I had substituted for a number of years. We had our first child. Uh, we were married eight and a half years before I had any. Not by choice, but just the way it happened. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, I had quit teaching a couple of years, thinking that perhaps that if I quit teaching, I might get pregnant, which didn't work that way hmm. for a while. And then through the years, I have done a number of things and have worked at the office, law office, when they need me, I go down and work, still do. Occasionally, they'll call me down. And your husband is a lawyer? And yes, he's an attorney. Okay. Um, how do you manage? Um, Actually, it probably isn't as hard for you as for some people with small children, for example, but you live here in Topeka during the week and go home on the weekend, mm -hmm. I would imagine. And um, It was hardest on my grandchildren, I think. Uh, one of my daughters has twins here now in kindergarten. And when they realized that their grandmother was living in Topeka, and this shows you what kids think now. Of course, they were about four and a half at this time. And they asked their mother if, Grandma and Grandpa were going to live together anymore. And so we made an effort when I was home to spend time with these children so they would be secure in the fact that I was up. Oh, how interesting. But we have uh, five grandchildren and another one on the way. And I think my daughters hated to see me get elected worse <laughs> than anybody because I did spend a lot of quality time with, with my grandchildren. And I miss that. I love them very much. But I'm not the typical Nana. <laughs> uh, again, this is a question I always ask. Clearly, um, legislators are not overpaid. Oh, no. Um, I don't know how people who actually have to earn their own living survive financially. I am secure in that my husband is basically supporting me and that I can afford a little apartment up here. But uh, we're paid $60 a day when we're in session. And then we get an allowance, a living allowance of $69 a day. And mileage just to and from home once a week. And that's it. And it, uh, it is a great personal sacrifice to a lot of people. Not only their time away from their families and their friends and their jobs, but actually from their businesses that I'm sure suffer a great deal. And it's, even at my age, it's difficult to be away from your spouse five days out of the week and not share a lot of the things that a lot of couples do. Mm -hmm. I try to call every day, and uh, they do give us that privilege. They don't want us to overuse it, but they anticipate we're going to call our family. Sounds weird. Yeah. kind of hate to have a legislator who never did. Uh -huh. What do you think of the amateur legislature in Kansas? You've just described a lot of its difficulties. Do you think we ought to have a professional legislature, which is a full-time job? I think perhaps extending the time of the legislature, or perhaps meeting every other year, might be worthwhile to consider. 
I have a nephew who's in the Colorado legislature, and they meet. He also is a They meet six months out. I feel that we got up here and we're very pushed into making decisions. Last year, one of the things I knew I was going to change this year, I had trouble actually reading all the bills that I should have. Mm -hmm. And we processed more than 1,000 bills last year in a very short period of time. And this year, my mail to answer stack gets higher, but I try to read the bills. That's mm -hmm. one of the things I do, mm -hmm. and I read them carefully. What, how would you say um, having been a legislature this long has changed you or your circumstances or your family? Oh, or a great anything? deal. Uh, I'm not privileged to worry about what my house looks like or have time to go shopping for this, that, or the other. Uh, I have been surprised that the time commitment has lasted not only while you're in session, but it did not let up all summer and through the fall till we came back. And one day there were five places I was supposed to be by the time I got up at one o'clock to bed at night. And at that point I sat back and I I made some choices about what I was going to do and where I was going to go. But having two communities that I represent does fracture the time. Mm -hmm. the question about them. Uh, I was expected to do things for the city of Lenexa. I'm expected to do things for the city of Olathe, uh, serve on different boards, this kind of thing. My husband, fortunately, is a very uh, understanding man. He, too, has had a number of uh, uh, positions that have taken him away. He's a past president of the American Association of Homes for the Aged, and that was a 10, 12 year commitment. He was on their board for a number of years, and as I was on the uh, Kansas Association of School Boards, and there's a three year, year president, well, like president, past president. So yep. he was gone a great deal. Um, he is, too, is quite interested in government, and he fortunately shares my interest. He does a lot of health care law. I can feed him a lot of information that I'm privy to that uh, uh, would be difficult for him to There we go. By feeding it to him, I mean yeah. that I, I just it comes across my desk and then I hand it back to him. Um, it is difficult for him because he's in the generation that I had meals on the table. The laundry was always done. And my house was picked up and fairly clean. And he's having to do a few things that he had not been taught to do before. And as I mentioned, my grandchildren miss my being around <laughs> and my children. Do. I think they're all quite proud of me, the fact that I did uh, get elected. And that, uh, uh, now, but we're I'm doing as best as I can. I think I've told you before that um, up until 1973, there were only four women ever in the legislature at the same time, and now it's 45. Why do you think this is? You've lived through all of this. What's changed? I think women now uh, are taking themselves I mean, more in control, when that if a woman oh, wants to do that, something, that she doesn't. I have sister-in-laws who have said to me, but don't you think you're neglecting Jean, my husband? See, she's ever heard of that county. I feel that, uh, you know, I'm fortunate that I have the support that I didn't have to make a choice. I'm either going to do this or else, which a lot of women like in the past have felt was a decision. Women are more open. They're very capable. They're not better educated than we used to be, but I think there is a, a different kind of education for women now. And women are more independent. And I think they realize that if a lot of the things are going to change, that it's going to take a female point of view to change them. Do you see any difference um, between your female colleagues and your male colleagues here? There's a bonding across party lines of, of some of the women, not all of them. 
but uh, I've had some very good friends that I've been in the legislature yeah. on both yeah. sides of the aisle. Um, we have uh, last year a couple of the women legislators got together and had a lovely dinner for all of us, which I thought was very nice. Um, two or three of the lobbyists have things that are just for the women. I get along with with men and women. Uh, I kid some of them sometimes, but I like boys too. <laughs> uh, Me too. I don't see any point in really segregating out. I had lunch just a little bit ago with uh, people off the children's initiatives. I think that most of the men up here hold the women in pretty high respect. And Marvin Marcus, who was the speaker, commented I brought him back in the car with a couple other people. He made the comment that sometimes it frustrates him that you try to engage in a conversation where one period in his life it would have been male dominated. He said it isn't that way anymore. He said, You women, most of you are thinking you're two or three jumps ahead of me and he said, I feel somewhat that I have to stumble along and catch up. I do not I have not been put down as a woman at all. And I think part of that is whether or not you allow yourself to mm -hmm. I think you're right. Well, is there something I should have asked you that I haven't? Something you'd like to get on the record or say? Well, I might say that I'm fortunate that I have a comparatively good health at my age. Um, because I was pretty much supported through the years by my husband, I have a long history of volunteerism. I was practically a full-time volunteer. So my, other than my not staying in a lake of Kansas through the week, this really has not changed me a lifestyle being active in the community in a lot of different well, ways. It's really kind of a culmination of yes, what you already were. So. And I have been able, I think, to uh, have some input into children's issues and education issues and, and uh, maybe through osmosis living around my husband so long, but uh, health care issues that I have some input here that serves me well. Sounds good. Thank you very much.